All right. Thank you for coming. And um, I want to talk about uh, Balls of Fire, A Science of Life and Death, which is on evolution. And so we're going to go back to 1965. And during that year, the biochemist Jacques Monod, with two colleagues, received the Nobel Prize for his work on proteins and genes. And in his book that he wrote in 1971, called Chance and Necessity, he said that the aim of science should be to clarify our relationship to the universe. So Jacques was exploring viruses and bacteria and proteins, and these are crystals. And so he obviously could see that the crystal structure, the very small, was similar to the crystalline structure of the stars. But my research does address uh, the universe and tries to clarify its meaning for us. But when I started out 15 years ago, I had a different question. And my question was, what makes great literature great? Why do we keep it? What value does it have? So I embarked on this quest, but there was one book I had to read. It was the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And I read the book, and there was quantum science in it. So I had to read the full funerary corpus to see if there was any more quantum science, which I did. It took me three years. And there was quantum science in it. The evolutionary message was that our DNA can evolve at death by merging with a microscopic virus. Well, when I came up with this thesis, this guess at the meaning of ancient Egyptian texts, I was horrified. A virus is associated with disease. And I was really disappointed. So I did a little more research because I was stuck with this thesis because eight major Egyptian texts, you know, supported it. So the first thing I learned was that the process that ancient Egyptians were describing, it was called horizontal gene transfer, a real process, and that is the exchange of DNA between two different species. Then I learned that in 1944, in a classic study, Oswald Avery and his colleagues discovered and showed that DNA released from dead and living cells persists in all environments. And DNA can actually be transferred from a dead cell to a living cell. So I felt a little more comfortable because that's what ancient Egypt was talking about. However, the Human Genome Project in 2001 um, pretty much confirmed for me that I should publish this thesis because what they discovered was that our DNA is a museum of ancient viruses. They sequenced the DNA and everybody was shocked again because here the human genome is full of ancient viruses. So what I did is publish the ISIS thesis, which was the study, and then the road from Orion, which connected the science with the um, great literature. And like all projects, this was not the end of my troubles because I had a thesis totally against the mainstream consensus of Egyptologists who believed that the funerary texts were simply magical spells. They believed that they were confusing, unintelligible, and primitive. And they are very confusing, but they are not unintelligible and primitive in the light of new quantum science. So quantum mechanics is, or the science of the very small, is a very sound theory based on mathematical solutions and also replicated experiments. So I felt a little more comfortable about that. And soon I learned that scientists were reaching consensus that the tiny quantum world orders our large classical universe. However, the laws of quantum mechanics are counterintuitive, crazy, wild, they're magical. 
So lots of my research sounds like science fiction. So what I would like to do today is take a look at some of these ideas. And after these, um, after a few of the slides, I'm going to break. And then if you have any questions, you know, you can ask them. Um, and this, this is some heavy duty material. So, okay, here we go. Let's tar start with the International Human Genome Project. They discovered we have our DNA is a museum of ancient viruses, and 2% of it codes for the proteins in this body that I'm wearing today. 98% is non-coding. Uh, what this means is the DNA is disordered, and scientists called it junk DNA. They also called it a cemetery of viruses. But actually what they learned was this 98% non-coding was from our microbial ancestors, viruses and bacteria along the evolutionary path. So the non-coding DNA is simply switched off and scientists are realizing now that it's actually a helpful DNA toolbox for some yet unknown purpose. So the question is, can the non-coding DNA be switched on for evolution? But before we get into that, I just want to talk a little bit about the bad connotation that microbes have, because I was affected by that when I created the thesis. But they can be classified as the good, the bad, and the ugly. Ugly viruses are like Ebola and H1N1 strains of the flu. Bad bacteria cause disease. But there are good viruses, and these are called bacteriophage. They kill bad bacteria, and doctors actually prescribe microbial cocktails for people with bacterial infections, and you just simply drink it. Um, these bacteriophage are known for being gene swappers, and they promote evolution. Now, the technical name for swapping genes around is called horizontal gene transfer. And the biologists believe that this is how the microbial genes entered our genome. And regarding sex, biologists look at sex differently. Of course, we have human sex, but they consider the transfer of DNA between any two species as sex. So a virus has sex with a bacterium, uh, a virus have sex with humans because they're exchanging DNA. What the ISIS thesis proposes is that the non-coding DNA can be switched on at a human death so that we can evolve. Okay, now we talked about Jacques Monod, and here he is one of the individuals that picked phage lambda out of a French sewer and won the Nobel Prize for analyzing it. But at the top here, you have what I call the fairy boat phage. It's the sun god from the ancient Egyptian text, the Amduit. And as you can see, he's encapsulated by a serpent there, almost centered. But this particular phage lambda that the ancient Egyptian texts are talking about is the same one that Jacques Monod um, researched and won the Nobel for. So this is a very special virus. It's ancient. Uh, it, the ancient texts in Egypt are saying that this virus is our last universal common ancestor. Uh, it's an interesting virus because it's luminescent. It has light properties. It emits light. And um, as you can see, it's a simple head that is icosahedral, which should remind you of the architecture of the pyramids. And then it has a tail. And inside the head is the DNA. Now, this DNA is special because lambda has a portion of its chromosome that it can carry other pieces of DNA from bacteria, from our eukaryotic cell type. And so it's a real evolutionary force. But it's, it's also 
has a protein coat around the head. And it's rainbow colored because it's composed of six transition metals, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc. And iron, cobalt, and nickel create magnetic fields. So this is a very interesting bacteriophage that um, modern science is really exploring right now. And it's the one that ancient Egyptian texts consider our last universal common ancestor. Now, the phage itself can self-assemble. And uh, Hendrix and colleagues in 2000 showed that this is possible. It can self-assemble for one gene that will do horizontal gene transfer. And then, of course, this bacteriophage is inside us, which is surprising again. And bacteriophage have also been found in the human genome. But let's look at our body here. And as you can see from this, we have what scientists call a second genome, and they call that the microbiome, which is teeming with microbial life. So that includes our intestines, our stomach, and the skin. Our skin is even included in the microbiome. Now, what researchers are discovering is that the microbiome, or our gut genome, is connected to our brain. And so our microbiome is actually modulating our behavior because it is connected to our brain. And then, just last week, new uh, research shows that we have an actual microbial cloud around us. They call it a microbial aura. And this is new research, 2015. And this aura actually extends out 34 inches. And it's emitted, they say, by our microbiome. And it emits 10 million bioparticles an, uh, an hour. So this is, this is quite shocking. But the little phage lambda here, as you can see from this, excuse me, is moving into the human body. And it is found in our gut in the helpful bacteria called E. coli. So, and that is a productive bacteria in our intestines that we really need there. Okay, now I'm gonna stop for a minute uh, for questions. I know, it's, it's difficult material. I have a question. Yes. yes. Um, the aura you're talking about, I was thinking about the chakras, our chakras, and the stomach is, um, this is where your solar plexus is. So I was wondering if that's the same kind of aura, if that's part of the seven chakra aura, or is that, is, is a microbial cloud, is that a different aura? We, that could very well be one of these chakras, be, because are the, the chakras are within the gut system, yeah. right? And the solar plexus is, is um, they call it the seat of the soul, and that's where your power is. So if that is there, maybe that has to do with the power. It definitely could be, and, and another um, fact that I know is years ago someone said to me, oh, you have a beautiful aura, it's blue. But when I heard this research last week, I was a little disturbed <laughs> to think it was full of bacteria, you know. But once again, within the bacterium, specific ones like E. coli, and um, Lambda, by the way, is an ancient virus, and it's like a mother of inventions because it has all these subfamilies that it has, like, uh, mothered, we'll say. So it's really an important virus, but the virus has the metallic qualities. So when they told me years ago I have a blue aura, that might have uh, referenced the, the metal, the transition metal cobalt, which is cobalt beautiful blue. But recently I've been told it, mine is pink, which makes me think I'm growing older. And, and so it must be manganese, because manganese is pink. So perhaps it is true that the aura that we really thought was our spiritual essence is um, 
microbial. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So, any other questions? Okay, so we're going to move along here. All right, so what balls of fire is explaining is that the viral DNA modulates our mind, which is connected to our brain, and its evolutionary message is reflected in our behavior. Okay, so if this is so, a good example is that the pharaohs invented baseball to describe Lambda's genetic switch between units of linked genes. So the pharaoh had a ball throwing right, and he'd throw to the four directions. He had the, the bull goddess was very important, like the bullpen. But what you have here is a baseball field, and home plate is um, at the bottom by the catcher's box, and then we have first base, second, and third base. So what was happening in Lambda's genetic switch, and this goes on all the time with this virus, is there's two major proteins and they're battling it out. And they each have a team of proteins that they work with. So the proteins are fighting to get to home plate. Now if we look at this, I want to call the big protein Goliath and the little guy David. Now, Goliath is big because he has 236 amino acids. David is small because he only has 66. Once again, that 66 is a very interesting number, and we find it 666 as the mark of the beast in Revelation. The way that Goliath makes it to its native state, and what a protein native state is, by the way, is where the protein becomes functional and it assembles itself. So Goliath folds, it runs from first base to second base to third gene base, and then it slides or folds into its native state. On the other hand, David folds in reverse from third to second to first, and then it slides into its native state. The problem is that Goliath, both proteins are after the first base gene seat and Goliath is closest to it. Now this is very, very simplified explanation of a genetic switch. So David needs to be turned on so he can beat Goliath. And what turns on David is several things, but the one I'm going to talk about is it's the DNA from human junk DNA. And it's a special protein called reverse transcriptase. In that 98% of our junk DNA, 15% is reverse transcriptase. And what that does is help David transcribe excuse me, transcribe in reverse so that it takes the native state. When that happens, both proteins cooperate. And what you have is a DNA wormhole, a microscopic DNA wormhole, because Goliath folds like a black hole. And so that would be the top section. And David folds like a white hole, which would be the bottom. And a black hole connected to a white hole is an Einstein-Rosen bridge. So what we have is biology and physics, two different systems with two viral proteins mimicking the dynamics of an Einstein-Rosen bridge. But it's actually a DNA wormhole. Now on your right below Goliath is a a sample of sort of a black hole protein folding funnel, and that's how Goliath folds. And we could just simply move that up to the top cone, whereas David folds like a volcano. It spits out. So that would be the bottom section. So what you have here is the volcano spitting out the particles that bind. 
Now this acts like reflection and it happens along the axis of a black hole. And I know that gets complicated. Um, so I'm going to stop here and ask for questions, if anybody has them. It's the, the biology of a tiny DNA wormhole works exactly like a microscopic Einstein-Rosen bridge. All right, let's go a little further. So the DNA wormhole is a micro Einstein Rosen bridge. Now here's where I push you off the cliff, if I haven't already pushed you off the cliff. So hopefully I come up for some oxygen here. But scientists talk about universality in complex systems. And that's when different systems behave identically. So what you have in ancient Egyptian texts is three identical waveform energy landscapes. You have a DNA viral protein wormhole in quantum biology that acts like a microscopic wormhole or Einstein Rosen bridge, and that acts like our expanding, collapsing cosmos which they call quantum cosmology. Now remember, quantum is simply referring to the science of the very small. And all through three of these disciplines are talking about the world of the small. So this may help too on the universe. Here's our universe. And it started from the Big Bang. It started expanding. And at that quantum core, everything was extremely small. And then it started expanding. And right now, what is happening with our universe? It's accelerating. And scientists call this an open universe. And so you can see there, the present in the center is 13.8 billion years of evolution. But we came from a quantum core. Now, many of our really top scientists today advocate the holographic principle. And what that simply means is that our universe is an illusion. It's a hologram. It's a projected shadow from the quantum world that is at the Big Bang origin. You've got David Bohm, um, the neurophysiologist Carl Prebrom, 50 years in brain research. Our brain, they think, operates by the holographic principle. Uh, Juan Maldacena, Gerard de Hoof, the um, Nobel laureate, and Leonard Susskin. I hope you've heard of some of these names. So there are also mathematical equations, Einstein's, for this universe to collapse. And when it collapses, it folds back in and a new universe is produced in much the same way that quantum biology, quantum physics, works. So we have three systems that behave identically. And I know these imagining how this work, works is tough. But I guess we have to look at our universe as a projected shadow from the quantum protein universe. Now there is evidence for the holographic principle. And it's a study by two scientists from Barcelona, Spain in 2010. This is all really new stuff. And on your left, they show our physical universe from the Big Bang to Earth and where we are now, 13.8 billion years. On the right, you have the protein universe. And their study showed that the Big Bang origin is identical to our last universal common ancestor and the first cells. And as you can see, they listed E. coli there as the first cells and marked Earth relative to it. And the Isis thesis does claim that the Earth is a sign of E. coli bacterium on the quantum level. So our universe exp expands from the Big Bang like the tiny quantum protein universe expands from the last universal common ancestor, the LUCA to the first cells. So this whole universe, this classical universe we're in, could be 
an illusion, a hologram. And that's what science is coming around to, even though it seems purely real, real to us, the world of matter. All right. Any questions so far? I know that's difficult. Okay, as we go along, maybe it's going to become clearer, especially when we get to Woodstock. But um, let's check this out. Okay, what Balls of Fire does, a science of life and death, is it presents the facts on Lambda's genetic switch. It, it presents amazing discoveries, complex problems, and the historical power grid. Now what you have here, in the book we have two teams of living and dead thinkers because I'm trying to show you our place in history and where we are today. So on your left you have the Thunderheads who believe in the primacy of matter or materialism. This is the real world. Our classical universe, they say, is the real world. But the Diamond Hearts believe that mind is primary, not matter, mind. And so you have a line up here, and I've just put their occupations because I didn't want to ruin it for you. Okay, but I'll give you two of them. The sci-fi writer is H.G. Wells, who wrote The War of the Worlds. And in that War of the Worlds, the Martians were coming, and the Martians were simply large, massive heads with huge brains inside. So Wells was depicting the result of human evolution on Earth, and he was anticipating that we could develop into these mass of, you know, metal heads, if you want to call it that. So, many perceive this, this um, stranger as an alien. But on the Diamond Heart team of mind, we have recently Nobel laureate Frank Wilsek. He's a physicist. And what he discovered in 2012 and 13 was the mathematical solution for an actual time crystal which is a real state of being with an extended, long, long lifetime. And the, his time crystal is very much like ancient Egypt's unique species, which is organic and viral. So that was... Now, what I think is overwhelming is the repeating evolutionary message in history if you start for ancient Egypt at the top, 2500 BCE, before the Common Era, you're going to find the message in early China, early Christian, Christianity. Uh, the Christian mass is a mirror of ancient Egyptian ritual and chemistry. The Aztec culture has it, the Navajo culture. And what I would do is I would randomly pick a society and then write a paper on it, and I would find the same message. The reputable alchemists had the message, such as Isaac Newton and Dr. Michael Meyer. Uh, the Tara Humaro tribe in northern New Mexico. New science has the message, and then of course it's found in Woodstock, and then also all those creative artists and historical individuals. So the 12 papers covers that and balls of fire summarizes this information. But I think what is unique is they're talking about embracing the cosmos in your brain. And so we have new research from Persinger and Corin in 2007 that tested the brain and confirmed that the brain has the capacity to hold the great fields of the universe within it. Our brains have the capacity. All right, let's see if this will shed a little more light. What science is doing today is looking and calling this our evolution, progressive evolution. And what that is, it's changing a little bit. It's Darwin's natural selection, which produces variation. But today, horizontal gene transfer is biology's next revolution. So. Horizontal gene transfer by viruses weaves in DNA between different species. 
So this is a very simplified uh, design, but we started possibly from viruses, moved up to bacteria, protists, and then um, humans. And this is a movement, our progressive evolution is a movement from highly ordered viral and bacterial genomes to terribly disordered genomes like the human 98% with only 2% effective. But what the ancient societies and creative individuals are talking about is regressive evolution. And this is reversion to ancestral type. And it has to do with horizontal gene transfer and it produces radical novelty. So we have a regressive movement from humans to protists to bacteria back to the crystal virus. And this is what these societies are suggesting happens at a death transition, that we can go backward in time, which is lawful, by the way, and I'll talk about that shortly. So macroevolution leads to microevolution, and what the texts are telling us is that phage lambda's genetic switch makes the transition from our large world of macroevolution to microevolution, where mutation, self-organization, and a gain of gene function occurs for human DNA. All righty. Any questions on that? Now, this is the scientific view. So what the ancient societies are recommending actually has the technical name of regressive evolution. Should we go a little further or any? Keep on. Okay. Okay, so we're into Woodstock now, which will be lighter. I think you're going to like this a little better. And Woodstock happened in 1969, and 400,000 young people went to a dairy farm in Woodstock. And it was basically a free concert because they broke down the ticket barriers, and everybody got in pretty much free. So very few of the musicians were paid. But here we have Spinning Wheel uh, by David Clayton Thomas of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Did you find the directing sign on the straight and narrow highway? Would you mind a reflecting sign? Just let it shine within your mind and show you the colors that are real. Catch a painted pony on the spinning wheel ride. Well, obviously, they're talking about three of the signs that work together as a family. The spinning wheel is a black hole. Reflection happens at the axis. And the rainbow gravity is also at the axis. So they're describing a tiny Einstein Rosen bridge or a DNA wormhole. Okay, Mountain was a band that played there. And Leslie West, their lead guitarist, um, wrote Blood of the Sun. And in this song, what you have is basically the same idea that the blood of the sun is the mother of invention and it would be possibly a sign of viral DNA, the hydrogen driving force, the light. And then they, they focus on the rainbow around the moon. So once again, we're dealing with the rainbow gravity and you would only see this rainbow appearance if you were at the axis of a black hole, a spinning black hole. So ancient cultures like Egypt make, make sure they identify this passage, and this is the passage for human transformation of DNA. Now, Janis Joplin was a headliner also, and Janis was singing in cosmic blues about trying to make the dream come, come true, and that time's moving on, and it's going to disappear when you turn your back. I said, you know it ain't going to be there. But what Janice is talking about is what scientists think our classical world is really like. Like I may be looking this way and see all of you, but behind me is a, a haze. Of course, if I look behind me, I see that and the rest of you become a haze. So we all function that way according to quantum mechanics. 
White Rabbit by vocalist Grace Slick of Jefferson Airplane. One pill makes you larger, one pill makes you small. Go ask Alice when she's 10 feet tall. And as we see on the left here, Alice followed the white rabbit down its tiny hole, which was a wormhole, we could say. Rabbit went in at one point, came out in some type of quantum DNA wonderland. And Alice followed through and she became small to do this. And in, in the quantum domain, logic and proportion make no sense. And the white knight is talking backwards, suggesting time reverse. Now, three easy, not so easy, quantum laws. Time reverse is permitted. It's lawful according to Newton, Maxwell, Einstein, and Schrodinger. Then you have entanglement, which is due to light speed perception. And entanglement simply means you are everywhere at once. Finally, everything is a pure yes, no phenomenon. So that it's like heads or tails. There's only two choices. What you pay attention to is what you get in the quantum world. It's very much like lucid dreaming. When you wake up and you're having a nightmare and then you say to yourself, hey, I don't have to see this image. And so you change your focus and it's gone. The monster disappears. So what ancient Egypt is advocating is actually a form of lucid dreaming. Then we have the, the fantastic guitarist Pete Townsend who wrote hundreds of songs for The Who. And he also wrote a rock opera called Tommy. And Tommy is a deaf, dumb, blind boy beyond the physical world. He's in a quiet vibration land like the quantum world. And Tommy is taking an amazing journey of the mind. He meets a tall stranger dressed in metal, silver and gold. And once again, we got that idea of the stranger. Pete also wrote, Go to the Mirror by The Who. And the mirror is another sign of this reflection process that occurs. Listening to you, I get the music. Gazing to you, I get the heat. Following you, I climb the mountain. And the mountain is a historical sign. This sign in ancient cultures and many traditions, they have the black mountain, the white mountain, the rotating mountain, the double mountain, and the mountain is the center of the cosmos. And then finally, I see the millions. And so this millions concept is sort of a quantum effect um, because cloning is involved in this process. You could call it cloning information, but it has to do with millions of quantum particles, we'll say. The Grateful Dead with Jerry Garcia, the song Dark Star, when Garcia was singing this, he would sometimes switch crashes for flashes. But I think we understand here that reason again is failing in this world. And what occurs is this nightfall of diamonds. And diamonds is another sign for, let's say, the stone, the rock, the crystal, the philosopher's stone. You can go on and on. And we have the mere shattering and formless reflections of matter. Glass hand dissolving to ice petal flowers revolving. Beautiful um, lyrics. And here we have Narcissus, who once again is a sign of reflection. Not so much self-love, but the process, the physical, quantum physical process of reflection in an Einstein rosin bridge. A virus is a cold crystal. In light of the holographic principle, you might call it a dark star. The question is, many of these signs are so similar with ancient societies. How did early cultures and rock musicians discover evolutionary knowledge? How did they all come up with the same thing? Well, they used entheogens. This is one possibility. Entheogen means generating the divine within you. And these are psychoactive substances. For instance, the ancient Egyptian pharaonic priesthood had the blue lotus water lily, that beautiful blue flower in the center. 
and they would put it in wine, and this would give them knowledge. They also had mysterious powders that were found in the Great Pyramid in the King's Chamber on the floor that um, modern scientists are analyzing. They found cocaine in mummies, which was surprising because it meant that possibly ancient Egypt was trading with South America, which baffled historians. And then, of course, the Aztec, they had psychoactive seeds, mushrooms, and peyote, as did the Navajo and the Tarahumara Indians. Woodstock had LSD and magic mushrooms. So, what all these people do, one explanation for it is they, they turned on, tuned in, and then dropped out of our classical cosmos. So, in brief review, the Isis thesis is the study of ancient Egyptian signs, showing that the G Egyptian deities are signs for human viral and bacterial DNA that is being immortalized at a human death. This is called genetic immortality. It's not a heaven for your body. The Road from Orion is a story, and it explains how great literature is great because it explains how DNA can evolve at a death transition. The 12 papers talk about causes, laws, rules, and probabilities for evolution, and also parallel signs in all sorts of different societies. Finally, Balls of Fire summarizes the research to date and finds the same hidden survival agenda message in baseball, ancient cultures, alchemy, literary texts, Christianity, world visions, our sciences, and history itself. And it presents this material by analyzing the mind-body problem using a baseball model of dead and living thinkers. So I'm ending here with, with Jimi Hendrix whose rendition of the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock was before about 30,000 people at the last day. He was the closer. He opted to be the closer. And it was an, a powerful emotional experience because with his guitar, Jimmy imitated the sounds of bombs descending, descending. And everybody was pretty much overwhelmed by that. But the key question here is, what is the meaning of existence? What is our destiny? And our destiny may simply be to gain knowledge so we know how to evolve at a death transition. And this knowledge may be why the grateful dead are grateful. Possibly. <laughs> Okay, any questions on that? Judy, would it? Yes. Do any of the, uh, does any of this lend credence to religions or cultures that believe in reincarnation? The, I think so, because what does occur if you don't have the knowledge, um, the pathway that they describe, and it involves the sun, it involves the axis of a black hole, the rainbow, you only see the rainbow gravity at the axis of a black hole. And obviously Woodstock people and others through um, psychoactive drugs could see all this. So reincarnation, it's possible, and I have not explored this heavy date, but reincarnation does explain that people come back and they travel around again. But what these ancient societies are saying is that if you don't know the route, if you don't have the, the knowledge, then what happens is your DNA, instead of being energized, your DNA becomes degraded and disassembled. And they call it the second death. Egypt calls it the second death. Early Chinese um, emperors call it your DNA going down the central drain spout like a sink and bye-bye DNA. And um, the Navajo call it the, the snake that, that crushes you to death, which was probably a reference to the crushing singularity at a black hole. So you need the knowledge. And reincarnation, I don't know, this is just what I'm thinking, is maybe the degraded DNA. You can't remember your past life, they say. So 
your DNA is degraded and then the elements of your degrade, uh, excuse me, the elements of your DNA are reassembled into a new form. That's my best guess. But once again, there's so much material here for more research. And I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to continue that research, but. Where can I get some good drugs in Gaylord? <laughs> well, yeah. So that what they're basically saying is that the quantum world, which is so counterintuitional, is like an acid trip. All right, and it's the the laws where time can go backward. These people that are having um, um, near death experience and they travel backward in time, that is totally lawful. So possibly what they've done is a quantum state reduction. Their uh, emergency or the accident or the lack of oxygen has driven them down to a quantum state. And this is where ancient Egypt is saying that when you pass, you go to the quantum domain, your DNA. And what all this research is suggesting is that your DNA is connected to mind. So DNA is projecting this information onto your mind brain. So it's DNA that is the control. And I came up with this little motto, DNA drives, the quantum world orders, science speak, and signs keep repeating. History is nothing but this repeated evolutionary message. But it's very difficult to get because the power elite are, are keeping the information silent. Um, the information is being distorted. We're not, we're not getting the true information. So to wade through all this information and knowledge is very tough, but once you get those core societies that I outlined, which were random picks, they all are saying the same evolutionary message. But it's the elite in those societies that understood it. Even the reputable alchemists, like Isaac Newton, Dr. Michael Meyer, they disguised their information in a secret code. They, they could not have the ignorant people knowing this information. So it's been camouflaged, it's been distorted, it's been literal, literalized, and no wonder we can't get the message. So you think that was to avoid persecution? Possible. Well, I think, now this is what I talk about in Balls of Fire. I think it's the nature of the genetic switch because a few will survive. The genetic switch has these two proteins and when they're cooperating you have Goliath operating as the degrading force and then you have David operating as the evolving force that goes upward. So it's down and it's up. So what, what I think is there weren't enough seats on the bus so the few can evolve but they need the degraded people or our DNA so that the whole process can even work. And there is research in Balls of Fire that explains that. So they had to keep it secret because it preserved their power position over the populace. And then it also assured them a seat on the celestial bus, we'll say, that goes up instead of down. Well, that's why they well, soon after, was it the 60s or 70s, where they completely outlawed all hallucinogenic drugs? Psychoactive drugs, exactly. Because they were, because it can destroy the power structure. Exactly. Now, actually, at Woodstock, LSD and these magic mushrooms, neither of which I have had, but I'd like to get my hands on some magic mushrooms. Uh, those, those are not addictive. Um, in China, opium is addictive, but the water lily is not. But all these psychoactive drugs today 
are banned. You cannot have them. Well, they give us insight into how we function. So, you know, the culture that we are in does not want us to have knowledge. That knowledge is preserved for the few. And you see that over the, in capitalism, where you have the, the elite um, ownership of property over the majority of people who have none. You see it in education, where the instructor is up here in front, you know, delivering information. Of course, that's changing because of the internet, where everybody can get the same information. In government, the powerful few at the top, it's always the few versus the many. And so I think it's, it's related to um, these two proteins and this viral competition, and that this is just the way nature is. Nature operates by saving the few over the many. And it's just the way nature is. And nature, of course, is a serial killer. <laughs> so, yes? When you're talking DNA, are you talking about double helix or triple helix DNA? Well, what I see, it could be a triple if we're thinking of the RNA transcript in there. And what I'm, the best way I try to explain what the texts have said is it's this DNA, the text describe the sun god and human DNA going into the cell and being transformed. And it moves to the cell and then it hits this certain point and then it reverse transcription. At that point, it doesn't circle around the double he helix. It goes right through the center. And they have studies showing this. Reverse transcription takes it right through the center of the DNA wormhole. So now a triple DNA, it could be involved, you know, I, but uh, right now, you know, I'm focused pretty much on that, that DNA wormhole. But you can throw in that RNA transcript and it, it sort of becomes a triple, uh, a triple transformation. So we can't get a hold of any LSD I, I don't think so. Anybody got a line on that? Of acid on paper that you put in your mouth and such. I don't know anything about them. I've never tried it. But growing up in that time period, I've seen people tripping. Well, Dr. Timothy Leary, who was booted out of Harvard for his experimental tactics, um, he was exploring LSD. And what is happening today is people are going back and they're starting to research LSD and other drugs like other psychoactive drugs. But LSD has actually got the same chemical structure as serotonin, the happy neurotransmitter in our brain. So, you know, it's not addictive. So, but I, I know nothing, yeah. unless we become part of a study, maybe you can try it that way. <laughs> But I hope this has given you a flavor for all this research, which is enormous, and it encompasses more than one discipline. Quantum cosmology, biology, physics, space physics, literature, music. It's in music. I haven't even, well, we, we touched Woodstock here. But it's in classical music. Gustav Mahler, uh, everywhere. I heard something that um, you know, like the Garden of Eden and the serpent and all that. Um, but the serpent is like the shape of the DNA. Okay. And it, I know the serpent and that shape is on a lot of different things. Um, but I read something else too about the something about what's on the Doppler bill. It's a triangle. Triangle. You know, with the, the lit up eye. Yes, and I heard something about that too. And the eye is a big sign in ancient Egypt because the crystal virus. Mm -hmm. It's well, they call the lambda genome has two arms, mm -hmm. all right, and one arm is pretty much controlled by um, Goliath, and the other arm by David. So it has these two arms. They call them eyes. So eyes of generation, I would say. But um. Same as Philosopher's stone and the um, the diamond 
and the, um, you know, how the pharaoh went, um, you know, wanted to transmute and become a star. Yes. That's all yes. the crystal virus. The crystal yes. skull of acid. Yeah. It's all yeah. the crystal skull. Uh, Beige lamina, right? The stars, I think, and remember if we shrunk the universe down to the quantum, mm -hmm. scientists today are saying that the stars are DNA written across the skies. So those magnetic fields in our universe, and remember lambda has the three transition metals that can create a magnetic field. Lambda, or let's see, viral and bacterial particles would represent the universe of stars, and that represents DNA written across the stars, once it is on the quantum level, because the quantum world is the real. It's projecting this large classical universe. So when you pass, you go back to the real quantum world of DNA and molecules, and back to the idea of the serpents and everything. A protein has helices. And it looks like serpents. It might have three or four of these circular serpentine legs. And as it folds, it goes through these different stages and it becomes, works from helices until it becomes its functional state where it's totally assembled at its native state. So s serpents and snakes are a sign of protein, protein activity and binding and folding. But I hope that is okay, and I, I, I'm going to have to close right now. But I thank you very much for coming, and I, I truly hope that answered some of the questions. I know it's heavy-duty stuff, but I hopefully have a flavor for the whole now. And um, good luck with Balls of Fire. Thank you. Long ago in ancient Egypt, Pharaoh's priests buried a secret, cast aside in ancient tombs, deep inside hidden rooms. This long lost secret all about death still lives within each pyramid text. It tells a story about human fate to transform a person to a timeless state. To transform a person to a timeless state, you need information on time and space. Our world as we know it seems real enough, though scientists tell us it's unreal stuff. The world as they see it is a hologram, a shadow of the real, which is quantum spam. Proteins fill the world plus the body you grow, but your mind is the key to your quantum role. Your quantum role and a higher ordered state, your quantum soul and your will to choose your fate. Your DNA survives when your body dies, and now is your chance to be re-energized. The choice is very simple because of chemistry. You can will your life as matter or energy. Earth is the abyss of photosynthesis, a gravity hole in space-time for matter to exist. Quantum laws allow the possibility to choose yes or no with probability. Go Pharaoh's way and you will overrule matter's realm of death overshadowed by the ghoul. To transform a person to a timeless state, you have to discover the white mountain gate. Each human body may decay at death, but mind as energy will never rest. You gotta make sure you take the mountain path. You gotta know how to save your quantum ass. So when you get the choice between two different ways, you gotta know how to escape matter's maze. What's real is a world of microquantum spam, where everything is everywhere with lots of RAM. And time travels backward at lightning speed to a state of quantum energy and infinity. Space-time may trap you in a gravity pit, an unreal city full of real shit. But DNA survives when the body dies. Remember the secret so your mind survives. Faith, hope, and charity is the Christian way. But straight Egyptian science will save your day. Matter is a waste, so take the energy path so your mind ain't consumed by the Christian god of wrath. What's real is a world of microcontum spam where everything is everywhere with lots of RAM. And time travels backward at lightning speed to a state of quantum energy and infinity. Quantum laws allow the possibility to choose yes or no with probability. Go Pharaoh's way and you will overrule matter's realm of death overshadowed by the ghoul. 
as your mind morphs to a tiny quantum state, make sure you're a person who participates. To use Pharaoh's knowledge of evolution science to choose the right path at that moment of defiance. You gotta make sure you take the rebel path. You gotta know how to save your quantum ass. So when you get the choice between two different ways, you gotta know how to escape matter's maze. Hey, listen real close to this astronomy so you all get the chance for immortality. Learn how to move to mind and energy cause hell is just conversion to the reverse synergy. We're all heading straight for the quantum cool, the good and the bad under one simple rule. Knowledge is power in the world of the spirit. Despite religious dogma, don't you fear it. Your quantum role and a higher ordered state. Your quantum soul and your will to choose your fate. Your DNA survives when your body dies. And now is your chance to be re-energized. This holy science ain't sci-fi. The Christian way lacks knowledge and defends die fi The Egyptian lost letter is now recomposed. Let's take back the power over the evolution of our souls. What's real is a world of microquantum spam, where everything is everywhere with lots of RAM. And time travels backward at lightning speed to a state of quantum energy and infinity.